welcome everybody to the Cone of Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I'm back today with the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Doug Mater, um, exotic veterinarian and writer extraordinaire. Dr. Mater has a brand new book out. It's called The Vet at Noah's Ark, Stories of Survival from an Inner City Animal Hospital. Um, he, we're not talking about that today, but I'm going to get him back on the podcast uh, very soon. And we're going to talk about his book today. He's helping me out with a medical case. We are talking about an African spurred tortoise that uh, has trauma. It's been slashed up a bit and it's doing that thing that tortoises do where it has pulled its legs into its shell as tightly as it possibly can. And I can't do anything with it. Guys, if you see tortoises, if you see turtles, this is a great uh, episode for just a refreshing on how to work with them. And uh, guys, I gotta tell you, this is <laughs> this is one that has me stumped. I go, I can't do anything with this patient. Doug made it to the rescue. Guys, this is a fantastic set of little pearls to have in your pearl box, I guess. Not a toolbox if it's pearls. Unless you want to put pearls in your toolbox, you can do that. Um, I have a pearl box for medical pearls, and Doug Mater is filling it up. And uh, that's what we're doing today. Guys, that's it. That's enough. So let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Doug Mater. Thanks for being here. Dr. Rourke, uh, Andy, um, thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. It's quite an honor. I, I love having you here. I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Whenever I, I have guests on the podcast, I, t- I take notes. I make this podcast because I want to be a better doctor and I want to learn. Buddy, I don't know that I've ever taken as many notes as I did last time you were on the podcast. I, I, I filled up, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it quietly as I turn pages to, to, uh, to get more of your pearls of wisdom. So thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I have a, uh, I have a, I have a case. Uh, I'd be honest, I'm a bit flummoxed, and right. uh, and I can do your help. All right. So again, I'm I'm embarrassed to ask this, but it's true. I have a 15 kilogram, so 30, uh, yeah, so 20, uh, 22, 22 pound uh, tortoise. I have uh, one of the uh, the sulcata tortoises, the African spurs. Um, this is a 10 year old uh, tortoise. The owners have this, uh, have this, have this beast and let it run around their backyard. And unfortunately, not, not funnily, it was, it was attacked by a dog. And so this uh, tortoise has been injured. Uh, the owners uh, say that the injury is significant. Um, I believe that that's true. Doug, I can't see this. It has pulled back into its shell. And I can't really work with it. And I don't, I don't know how to examine this patient, much less how to sort of treat these wounds. And so let me just reach out with that uh, big, broad opening and say, how do you treat this? How, how, do I, how do I do right by this patient? Yeah, you know, Andy, that's a, that's a, a sadly, that's a fairly common scenario. And don't, don't be at all embarrassed for asking that kind it's of question. It's super because, embarrassing. No, I was like, man, I can't, I don't know how to deal. do this. I mean, a dog or a cat comes in and, and you can put your hands on them and do an exam and look at the paw, look in the ear, open the mouth. How do you do that to an animal that's a black box when they suck in like this? Yeah. And you have to remember that for these tortoises, they can't fight back. So their response to fear, to pain, to anything is to suck into their shell, right? So yeah. the dog attacks it and treats it like a big moving rawhide and chews it to pieces. And then they bring it to you. And now you want to handle it and carefully with loving hands, protect it and take care of it. It doesn't know any better. All right. it knows is that it hurts and it's scared and it's had a bad time. So it's going to suck in even tighter. And of course, if you try and grab it a foot or a head or a tail, what's right. it going to do? It's going to fight you and pull back even more. So don't, don't oh, yeah. be embarrassed. And that's a good question. That's a challenge. It really yeah. is. I'm, I'm, and I'm pulling on these legs that I know are injured. You know, I know that yeah. this is where this thing got bitten. And I'm like, I don't want, I want to pull this guy's leg out. I mean, that it well, seems your like I'm, is great. If you fall off your skateboard or your bike or whatever, and you break your arm, do you want that doctor grabbing your arm? No, you don't. Okay. Analgesia number one. Okay. okay. Don't be afraid to sedate this animal. Now here's your biggest challenge that you're going to have is to convince the client that it's okay to sedate an injured animal. 
Because so oftentimes they're like, oh, I read on the internet that if you sedate a reptile, you know, they, they, they don't breathe and they die. That's not true. So you're fighting Dr. Google. Right. So you need to be able to wordsmith it. And, you know, most, I, I know your clients adore you and, and you have their trust, but maybe this client's a new client has never met you before. Okay. Um, so you've got to be able to convince them that you need to trust me and respect that. I've done this before. Your pet tortoise, A, is in a lot of, lot of pain and B, is afraid. Um, and C, I need to be able to get to him and help him. I'm going to have to give him something for pain so that he's not hurting and something to sedate him so I can do a proper exam. And that allows me to make him feel better. And I know that's what we both want. Yep. So what do we use? Okay. Um, I've been doing this now for almost 40 years. And my go-to drug, hands down, across the board for reptiles is telazole. Combination okay. of teletamine and zelazepam. Teletamine is a dissociative like ketamine. Zelazepam is a benzodiazepine like uh, midazolam or Valium. It's a great combination drug. Why do I like it? A, because it's a cocktail. Yep. B, because uh, the teletamine does offer some analgesia. Um, C, it works quickly. Um, so you get this 10 kilogram tortoise um, and sulcatas. I start with 10 mg per kg I am in the front leg, but okay. I've gone up as high as 30 because wow. sulcatas, I have found of all the species, all the different tortoise species, sulcatas tend to be one of the most difficult to sedate. So yep. I start with 10 mg per kg, give it a half an hour. And if there's no relaxation, give it another 10 mg per kg. Um, most of the time, it takes about 15 minutes if the patient is warm. Now, if it's South Carolina and the animal's out playing in the snow, which it shouldn't have been, right. and it comes in hypothermic, 100 mg per kg is not going to work. The animal has to be warmed. If you warm them up to their preferred temperature zone, which for a sulcata is about 90 degrees, okay. you're going to respond like a mammal. Okay. Hey everybody, I just want to jump in real quick with a couple of updates. Gang, before I do though, I got to get a shout out. I got to get some love to Banfield, the pet hospital. Guys, they have stepped up and supported us in getting transcripts for both this podcast and the Kona Shame Veterinary Podcast, which is the other podcast that I host. They do it uh, to increase accessibility and inclusion in our profession. That is a, uh, that is a big, uh, Point for them right now is, is something that they are doing for our whole profession and industry and they stepped up and put their money where their mouth was and said how can we help you and i said hey this is a thing that people have asked for and uh it's a it's a big lift for us and 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 banfield said we got you buddy and they have made this happen so if you want transcripts for our podcast we got them head over to unchartedvet.com you can see all of our podcasts and you can see transcripts for those there feel free to share them help us get the word out but i just gotta give some love to banfield because they didn't have to do that but they did and it is awesome so thanks to them over at uncharted online on june 29th at 8 30 p.m eastern time 5 30 pacific that is uh p.m not a.m uh we're not doing the 5 30 a.m pacific thing guys over at uncharted online so you can join from anywhere my friend the one and only practice management goddess stephanie goss is doing her teamwork mind meld setting expectations for team communication. Guys, do your teams struggle from a lack of accountability? You're like, people don't do what they say they're going to do. And people don't follow up the way that they should. And people don't communicate in a way that stuff actually gets done. And they are making uh, assumptions about what is going to happen that are not realistic. And it is continuing to cause problems between the team and management. Guys, I see this all the time. Stephanie Goss's workshop is all about setting expectations for how the team is going to communicate. Just think about how much you need that. Gang, this is a two hour actual workshop. Come with your uh, camera, come ready to talk about your practice. So this is going to be stuff that you can take home and plug right into what you're doing and actually make a difference in the way your, your practice functions and to take this back and engage it with your team in a way that's going to make a difference. Guys, I hope you'll check it out. 70 Goss is amazing. Uncharted workshops are, uh, and they're uniformly pretty freaking fantastic. I do love them. I'll put a link to that down in the show notes. Guys, as you might have heard, my brand new exam room communication training course, it launched on June the 7th. It is my 17 tips, tools, tricks, and hacks to make you and or your team more effective in the exam room. Guys, this is the stuff that I lecture on all over the world. It's my absolute best material. I wanted to make it available to everybody. I have people who always come up to me after my talks and say, that was great. 
how do I teach my staff to do that? And I got you now, buddy. I've got you covered because you can take this to your team. It is 100% module. It is broken up into five minute modules that you can drop into your staff meetings, tag it onto the end of a, of a team training meeting. You can do it in a morning huddle. You can go through and everything stands alone. So you can pick the things that you like, skip the ones that you don't. You can look and say, we need this the most in our practice. Let's do this. Guys, the course pays for itself. If there's one thing that you take and you give to your team and they go, oh, light bulb moment it is, it is um, the fact that it's made to go back to your team and be interactive, which means everything comes with discussion questions. So you can say to your team, how do we do this? What does this look like in our practice? How could we do this better? What opportunities do we have for improvement here? And, and I give you those suggested wordings and questions to ask so that you can get your team to engage. Guys, I'm super proud of this. I'm super happy for the first 30 days. So until July the 8th, uh, it's $100 off. It is a launch special. I don't want this to slip past you. If you're like, I want to try that out grab it uh grab it now uh grab it while it's got a hundred dollars off i'll put a link in the show notes but guys i hope you uh love it and you enjoy it and if uh if you haven't checked out my charming the angry client course it's built in a similar model it's been very very popular people who have had it can tell you about what it's like um you feel free to ask because it has gotten very good reviews and a lot of people have gotten a lot of mileage out of this but guys i want you to be able to train your team, specifically your team, not some generic team. I want you to train your team in a way that's gonna work in your practice. And this is why I made this tool, so it can get taken and used as you want to use it. So it supports your culture and your practice and the way that you guys work. And um, anyway, I hope you'll check it out. I am, like I said, I'm over the moon that it is launched and uh, boy, it's been a lot of work for me and my team, but I think it's gonna be totally worth it for, uh, for those of you who check it out. All right. Let's get into this episode. Yeah, yeah. How, how, how long does it take to warm a tortoise? So I think I misspoke at the beginning. So, so we're talking about 15 kilograms, so 30, you know, 33 uh, pounds. If this, if this tortoise is cool, how long are we talking about to, 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 to warm it up to a temperature that I'm going to be able to work with it well? Excellent question. And that, that brings up two real very important side points. Number one, I've heard people say gradually warm them, and that's baloney. If okay. it's an emergency, warm them up. So if you have an incubator, um, I'd set that incubator at 95 degrees Fahrenheit and okay. take that tools and put them in there. And how long does it take to answer question number two? About 24 hours. Okay. And then point number three, it is the rare, <clears throat> excuse me. So it is a rare reptile that can't wait 24 hours to be properly warmed up and hydrated. If it is not warm, all the medications you give are not going to work. Okay. They're not predictable. Okay, let's just jump ahead and assume that the animal was brought to you this morning. You were in surgery. Your awesome technician put it in the incubator. You went ahead and you took a spot temperature with it with a, with a gun. Or maybe, maybe you were lucky enough to get a cloaca and get a cloacal temperature and it's it's 88 degrees. Okay, Telazol, I like it. I'd start with 10 mg per kg. I am in the tricep. They have mm -hmm. a hepatic portal system. So if you give it in the back legs, first pass effect, it goes through hepatic conjugation. And it has been well documented that it minimizes the effect of the telosol. You give it in the front legs, boom, they go down like that. 15 wow. minutes, 30 minutes maximum, totally relaxed. You can extend the limbs, do your exams, get your radiographs, extend the head, access either jugular vein, get a blood test, telosol 10 mix per kick. What else can you use? I've heard people say they don't like telosol because you have to reconstitute it. If you don't use it within 14 days, it goes bad. If you're like me, I go through a bottle a day, just about, it seems like. Um, but, you know, you can put it in a freezer, too. Um, it, it'll last. Um, if you don't want to use telozol, <clears throat> excuse me, you can use uh, dexmedetomidine. Okay. 50, 50 micrograms per kilogram I am in the front leg. Again, uh, there's a first pass effect with the hepatic portal system. Um, you can reverse the dexmedetomidine. But remember, dexmedetomidine is a really good analgesic. Yeah. And that is not an anesthetic dose. That's a sedative dose. So that's enough to open their mouth and intubate them if you wanted to induce them with ISO. Um, but oftentimes I don't, re I don't reverse it. And the reason I don't is because it's such a great analgesic. Mm -hmm. um, takes about the same amount of time. Um, I do know some people throw in a little bit of ketamine with it, but a few studies that have been done have shown really that ketamine doesn't make a lot of difference. So I okay. just go straight 50 micrograms per kilogram of the dexmedetomidine. Um, you can use midazolam. I like it because it can be given IM, and I usually use about 0.2 to 0.5 uh, 
On a Slicata, I'd probably use 0.5 mix per kg um, IM. And it takes a little longer to work, about an hour. And then okay. you can reverse it with flumazenil if you need to. That's not an analgesic. That is just a sedative. Um, but again, my go-to drug of choice, hands down, is telazole. And I'm going to circle back to that. One of the reasons I really like it is the dose is really small. So yeah. you get yourself a big sulcata that weighs 100 kilograms, which is not unrealistic, okay? Wow. And you're only giving two cc's, whereas yeah. you might be giving 20 cc's of dexmedetomidine. Right. What's easier to do? Okay? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, Helazole is awesome stuff. Okay, so gotcha. get that animal in. You warm it up. Even if you have to wait a little while, warm it up. Um, if it's got some obvious surface injuries to it, on a heating pad, start using warm water, flushing it, cleaning it, addressing the surface wounds. Once that patient's, t you know, after it's warmed up a bit, give it the sedative. Once it relaxes, then you can do your proper exam. Get your radiographs, get your blood work, address wounds. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're one of these animals that have severe, severe wounds, and some of these dog bites can be horrific. I mean, yeah. large pieces of flesh torn off, and, and you can't really graft reptiles well. They don't have a sub-Q layer. Uh, it's hard to do sliding grafts and punch grafts. Um, but the beauty of a reptile is that they have a tendency to granulate in from the outside in. And I've had animals come in with horrific, giant defects that with proper wet to dry, sunny bandages, things like that, will heal in four to six months. Okay. Now, if you have to change the bandage on this guy every day, okay. You give him the tetas all the day, he wakes up, he's doing better. The next day you go out to change his bandage and he's doing this again. Yeah. Okay, you need to sedate him again. Don't fight them. You know, why do you want to grab that injured limb that we talked about and give them more pain? Just sedate them again. I think of one case that I have that was attacked by a pack of dogs and it was literally sedated every day for four months. And we actually had to rotate between tetazole and dexmedetomidine and midazolam because it kind of developed a, a resistance to the tetazole. We were giving it 40 mix per kg about four or five or about three to four weeks into it. And it was still um, fighting the sedation. So then we switched to dexmedetomidine. So don't be afraid to sedate it every day. Um, I did my residency in primate medicine. And when we would get these primates that would get in these large monkey brawls, we would literally have to put them under every single day to change wounds. Wow. Um, and it's amazing how well they do. And it's so much easier to sedate them, do the wound care and the vet care, and then let them wake up than it is to try and stress them and use Brudicane. We don't want to do that. Yeah, definitely. So it comes in, you sedate it, you do your wound care, of course, Utmost importance, address analgesia. If there's wounds, it's perfectly appropriate to use an antibiotic in these cases. And it's going to be a gram positive in this situation because it's environmental. If it's a dog bite, you worry about the uh, uh, anaerobes, so bacteroides, fusobacter, uh, uh, peptostreptococcus, all the things found in dog mouths. So you might want to use something um, along the lines of subtazidine because that gets your environmentals. And it's about 80% effective against your anaerobes. Um, and I think that's a good go for something like a dog bite. Um, if you went with a fluoroquinolone, wouldn't be my drug of choice. You would want to use something like a penicillin or maybe a metronidazole for the anaerobes in a bite wound. Um, but again, that wouldn't be my, my first line of choice. So analgesics, I like ketophen, and it's easy to give injectably. Um, and then the other thing, too, is when this animal is out, when you have it under sedation, go ahead and put in a feeding tube. Now, because there's that old adage, if the mouth works, use it. And I can't stress that enough to veterinarians and the, and the technicians and the pet owners. If the mouth works, use it. Now you can give them oral fluids. You can give them oral antibiotics. You can give them oral analgesics. And you can give them calories. And the beauty it is they handle these, these feeding tubes so well. And then as the animal is feeling better, you can pull the tube without sedation. And the little fistula where the tube was it heals up like a dog and a cat. Yeah. Okay. So that's and again, nice. you know, it's a reptile. Um, in this case, they may have gotten injured very quickly, but healing is going to take time. You got to give some of these wounds three, four or five months sometimes, depending on how bad it is, and they will heal. So, uh, so setting expectations for the clients, because this makes perfect sense. And the feeding tube makes, makes a ton of sense for, for those, uh, for those tortoises that we, we think we may have to sedate, say we say we're doing uh bandage changes, uh, you know, daily or every other day for, and, and we're expecting a, a couple of months to granulate in. In your experience, if I have a, a patient like this and, and I have to sedate them the first day and I have to sedate them the second day, should I be going ahead and, and prepping the pet owner to say, hey, this is what it's going to be for the long term? Or yeah, do you have I, patients that, that, yeah, that I, get more on board? 
you, you bring up a really good point. And, you know, I, I talk like everything is a perfect world and we'd like it to be, but we know it isn't. Um, many of these cases, they're going to heal. They're going to get better. You just have to be patient. But you need to prep the client that this animal may take six, four to six months of bandage changing, intense initially, progressively getting less and less and less. But you're looking at a lot of money. Gotcha. And make sure they understand that because, I mean, to sedate that animal with telozole or dextormator every day, you're looking at some bucks plus the yeah. tech time, the bandage time, the doctor assessment time, the follow up blood work or cultures or drugs. So, you know what? Your patient's going to get your, your pet's going to be okay, Mrs. Smith, but you should be aware it's not going to be better by Monday. You know, and frequently what I'll do is I, I have a lot of drama. I'll walk over to the calendar in the room and I'll flip forward two or three months. I say, you know, it's March right now. April, May, June, probably June, July, right about here on the calendar. I think, you know, that might be pretty close to where we're getting the resolution. So when they see the pages flip, they understand we're not talking about a week's worth of drugs. Yeah. So, and if they're willing to buy that commitment, great. And you know what? I always believe that the patient comes first. It doesn't hurt my feelings if they want to buy the meds online. I don't mm -hmm. care. I want that pet to get better. I'll write the script for them. Um, if they want, you know, to do the bandage changes at home, if they're comfortable with that, I'm good with that. I want that human animal bond. We need to preserve that. Yep. And whatever we need to do to help them within their financial constraints, get to that end goal of a healthy pet. That's what we got to do, you know? Yeah. And, you know, so much of what we do is the art of medicine, you know, the art of veterinary medicine as opposed to just the, the drugs and everything else. So. No, I agree. Uh, this is fantastic. This is super helpful. I feel like I've got some tools in the toolbox uh, and I know the ways to use them uh, to, to, to get a good exam, to, to start to take care of this patient, to, to get us back on the road to healing. Are there any last pearls that you have that I should keep in mind as I approach a case like this? Are there any pitfalls that I should make sure that I avoid? Yeah, you know what? I think we hit most of it. There's a couple things. And again, this could be a future podcast. Um, you know, we're assuming that most of these wounds are soft tissue wounds, but we mm -hmm. also know that big dogs, when they bite turtles, they can damage the shell. Um, you know, cracks in the shell have to be approached like a fracture because the shell is living bone. So we treat it like we would treat any bone fracture. Um, punctures in the shell, uh, we need to treat almost like they were punctures into the thorax. Uh, okay. Reptiles don't have a diaphragm. They don't have a negative space. But if you puncture their shell and pathogens and bad stuff get inside, it can cause the coelomitis. Um, so you need to treat those as open wounds. Um, it's funny because I probably haven't used fiberglass on a turtle shell in 30 years. Um, everything I do now is wet to dries or honey bandages. I love wet to dries and these shell wounds, even big defects, will regranulate and grow new bone from the inside out. It's amazing how reptiles heal. And I kind of, I always joke, and it's really not a joke because people think I'm smart. I'm not. I just picked an animal that's very good at healing and uh, I tend to be their spokesman. So reptiles are pretty amazing animals. We just have to be patient. That's that's amazing. Doug, thank you so much for being here. Where can people find you online? Well, if, if you uh, want to try and get a hold of me or find out more, I do have a website. It's called DougMater.com. I also have a good Facebook page. Um, my contact information is on the website. If you need some help, you know, reach out. I'm good about answering email questions. Um, and, you know, my, my goal, Andy, is just like yours. And, and that is I wake up every morning and I want to do everything I can to support that human pet bond. Um, and any way that I can help you and your technicians, our colleagues and our clients keep that bond growing and staying alive, I'll do what I can. And I, you know what? Thank you so much for the invitation. And I, it means a lot. It, it really is quite an honor to be invited. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my friend. And that's our episode. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Dr. Doug Mater is flipping amazing. Uh, check out his book, The Vet at Noah's Ark, Stories of Survival from an Inner City Animal Hospital. He is a fantastic writer. Uh, he's an amazing educator. Uh, as I talked at the very beginning, he has such an impressive resume. Um, he, is, he is someone that I look up to. And, and man, I aspire to to be able to teach like he does uh, in, in some in some capacity on some topic someday. He, uh, I just, I appreciate Dr. Major for being with us. Guys, take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you soon.